Hello, everyone. Um, it's uh, now six o'clock, so we're just going to get started here. So, um, hello and welcome. To, uh, hello and welcome to music from Indigenous Perspectives featuring Diet. This event is a part of the Augustana Indigenous Speakers series presented by the Cargill, oh, presented by Cargill in partnership with the Chester Ronning Center for the study of religion and public life and the Jean and Peter Lougheed Performing Arts Center. So first, before we begin, I would just like to start off with, uh, with our land acknowledgement. And so the land on which we are gathered here, uh, <laughs> we're gathered here, traditionally known as Asinisco Sipisis, Stony Creek is uh, formerly known as Treaty 6 Territory and a traditional meeting ground for many Indigenous peoples. The, the land on which the Augustana campus and of the University of Alberta is located, provided, <laughs> is located and provided a traveling route and home to the Muskwachis Nihiawak, Nitsitatapi, Nako <laughs> Nakoda and Sutna nations, the Métis and other indigenous peoples. This spiritual and practical relationship to the land create a rich heritage for our learning and our life as a community. So, hi, hello everyone. I'm Victoria Delorme and I am Nihio, uh, and I am a Nihiasguero currently living in a Miskwitis with Gaigan or what's formerly known as Edmonton. My family lineage derives from the Southern Saskatchewan region in what we formerly know as Treaty 4 territory. And I am from, I am from Cowsis First Nations community um, that's in the Quabal Valley over there. So I am currently the Student Experience Coordinator, Indigenous Student Services. Apologies about that. There's an emergency alert that just came out. Um, but yeah, so I am a student experience coordinator uh, at Augustana and do the Indigenous Student Services um, out of the office there. And I will be your host tonight. So thank you, everyone. So uh, the Augustana Speaker Series represents a continued effort to respond to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's calls to action and will provide opportunities for participants to engage with speakers, films, music, and art performances, sharing perspectives from Indigenous peoples, cultures, and traditions of Canada. These events will be, these events will include both Indigenous and settler voices to address the importance of genuine allyship, as well as the importance of listening to the lived experiences of Indigenous peoples, as well as acknowledging truth and healing as a, as a means forward together. Tonight's presentation is about 45 minutes in length, followed by a question period. We will be collecting questions throughout the presentation. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions at any time. At the end of the presentations, these questions will be shared to our presenter to address. I'd now like to introduce today's moderator, uh, Andrea Corda. So Andrea is an associate professor in the fine arts and humanities at the University of Alberta's Augustana campus, where she teaches art history. Her current research as a part of the Crafting Communities Project considers how hands-on crafting practices can, be, can help enhance teaching and learning in the humanities classrooms. And she is also working on a book project on the materials and visual cultures of education in the 19th and 18th centuries. Andrea? Thank you, Victoria. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight for what promises to be a very inspiring evening. I look forward to moderating the Q&A session following tonight's presentation, and I want to encourage you to share your questions through the Q&A feature on Zoom. I am delighted to be welcoming Diet to our speakers series tonight. Diet spent her childhood on the ancestral lands of the Kluwani First Nation people in Canada's Yukon Territory. Coming from a family that embraced adventurous hippie attitudes while remaining rooted in traditions, Diet has created a musical presence that is as diverse as her Southern Chuchone, Tlingit, Japanese, and Scottish heritage. 
She discovered her voice singing on the school bus, went on to acquire a degree in music, and then became a published songwriter in Vancouver. When the pull of the North grew too strong to resist, she packed her bags and moved back to her village of 90 people. The result of this unlikely career move has been international collaborations, extensive touring, and two acclaimed albums, with a third album, Diet and the Love Soldiers from 2018, receiving nominations for Folk Album of the Year at the Indigenous Music Awards. That same year, she was named Indigenous Artist of the Year at the Western Canadian Music Awards and Indigenous Songwriter of the Year at the Canadian Folk Music Awards. During the last decade, Dayette and Love Soldiers have performed nationally in Canada and internationally in Europe. Performance highlights include major folk, jazz, world, and multidisciplinary fest festivals, excuse me, and theaters in Canada, a tour in the UK, and upcoming tours in Germany and the Netherlands. And today she comes to us live from her hometown of Burwash Landing, Yukon. Welcome, Dayette, to our virtual stage. Dunje Dahuan. Hi, everyone. ING Dayet Uye. Su on man ke yi ninje. Lal tuch anich e. Kajet ye jelly che. Hi, everyone. My name is Dayet, and I'm coming at you from the beautiful shores of Kluani Lake. I am from this area, and we call ourselves Mountain People because we're surrounded by the tallest mountains in North America. And we're sitting right up high in elevation on the shores of a very large glacial lake. Ama gudia uye, asua tutlasen uye. Ata john uye, asia Fred Chambers uye na. My mother is called Gudia, and my grandmother is called Tuthlesen. My dad is called John, and my granddad on my mother's side was uh, Fred Chambers from the Thlingit in Alaska. I'm really happy to be here tonight to talk with you and share some of my story with you to discuss some of my thoughts, I think, and ideas about what it means to me to be a First Nation Indigenous songwriter uh, in this country today and in, in how I see myself sort of fitting into this, you know, global uh, community. And before we get started on all of that, I think it's important for me to tell you a little bit about where I'm from. So you have an understanding of what it really is that is the underlying, I guess, message or the underlying river current that runs through my creative being. A long time ago, before real contact here, and I say a long time ago for me, but probably for the rest of Canada, it wasn't that long ago, and I'm talking about 120 years ago. My great, great grandmother came over the uh, Ruby Range Mountains with her family. She was a young woman and she was to be married to my great-great-grandfather, Siddhartha. Enna was a very strong, beautiful young woman, and her family came from a, a place that we now know as Fort Selkirk, along the Yukon River. And they came over these mountains, her family, to, to bring her to her new family. And there's lots of stories about her entry into this country of uh, Thu'an Munkei, Kloani country. When she was presented 
there was a very large curtain. And I imagine this curtain was probably sewn together by uh, caribou and maybe moose hides, sheep hides. And when she came through the curtain, she was wearing a, a, a white uh, moose hide outfit with very long gloves. And she danced her way into this country. And she went on to live a beautifully long life. And she shared that life with my great granddad, great, great granddad, Siddhartha's other wife. There were two wives and they happened to be best friends. Go figure. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> um, and she was an incredible storyteller. I never actually got to meet her because she passed away before I was born. But the stories that have been passed on about this wonderful matriarch to our community and to our family really set a lot of tones for, um, you know, the, for how we, uh, I guess, live our life in a good way. And so I'm going to share a song that her brother had brought, I guess he shared this song and it comes from their country. And she sang it on a, a, on a recording that I had heard. It was an archival recording. And the, and the moment I heard it and I heard her voice, I was instantly moved deep, deep within me. And she speaks in this uh, song about friendship and about perhaps the bittersweetness of meeting people and then, and then having to leave, people that you love. Um, and what I love about this song in particular is because she was multilingual and most indigenous people were multilingual and still are. She spoke Northern Toshone, Southern Toshone, our language. She understood Flinget and Upper Tanana. She also learned to speak English because why not? And what I love about this song is it's, it contains a mixture of many languages. And um, there's one word in English in this song and it's goodbye. And I think it's an interesting word uh, because in our language and like so many indigenous languages, there are, is no word for goodbye. It's a foreign concept of saying bye forever. So um, this song, I, I call it Shicha, which kind of means my, my grandfather, my grandmother, and it also means, or my grandchild, and it also means uh, my friend. Hey ya, hey ya, hey ya. Goodbye, Shania, oh Amma. Hey ya, hey ya. Goodbye, Shania, oh, um. 
Joni Thun, thank you very much. Um, before I get started and, and sort of start, you know, to tell you my story, I should also let you know that um, where I live is about three hours from Whitehorse, which is the only city in the Yukon. <laughs> My community is uh, very small, it's mostly my family, <laughs> and we're at about 100 strong in winter. Uh, and while we do have high speed internet, it is, um, it sometimes is dependent on the weather. We've been having really clear, beautiful skies, and I thought this is going to be wonderful uh, for internet purposes. Um, and it, they decided to be a snowstorm today. So if there's a little bit of in and outs or lagging, that's likely the reason. <laughs> and also I've got three dogs running around downstairs um, and uh, two children. And um, yeah, so you might meet the rest of my family. <laughs> so I want to start now and I wanted to start telling you about my story. Uh, I was born literally in a tent. Uh, my, my mom and dad were really, you know, they were really committed to coming back onto the land. My mom was especially. See, my mom was a child that went to residential school. She was removed, her and her brother were removed from the community along with all of the other children when she was five years old and she was taken uh, to a convent in Whitehorse and she stayed there for many many years and they came home in the summer uh, you know but she said even though she was close she was so far away there was uh, you know I have a story that my grandmother told me about her want, missing her children so much that uh, she asked the priest in the community if she could he could drive her into Whitehorse, which he did. And the convent was fenced off. And she was on the outside of the fence. And she sat there and looked for her children. Uh, but they weren't allowed to communicate with each other for fear of um, punishment. And so even though she was so close, like I said, in, in proximity, she was so far away. So when she came back to the community as a teenager, like so many other stories, when people, when, you know, the students came home, and these young adults came home, they were completely displaced. They were displaced from the Western society. They were also displaced from their own home communities because they uh, lost their language. They lost much of the connection. And that big connection was severed in, in many ways. And one of the, the biggest ways in our communities is our, our culture is so tied to the family unit. In our way, your mother, if we're matrilineal, so we follow our mother's side. Our mother, we have more than one mother. If your mother has sisters, those sisters are also your mothers. If those sisters have children, those children are not your cousins, they are your brothers and sisters. And we, and one of the things that happened when the children were removed was that family unit broke down. And my grandmother said, can you imagine what it was like and how sad it was when the kids were gone and how quiet it was? It was so quiet in the village. And hearing that is like, you know, it just, it kind of just rips your heart out <laughs> because that, that connection of family, when it becomes severed, takes many, many generations to repair. 
So going back to the beginning of my story, my mom was determined that her children would not uh, have that feeling of disconnect. And so she did everything in her power to ensure that we had a life that was connected to our community and our culture. So when I was born in a tent, my parents had decided that they were going to go back to the land. And we, you know, after we, I was born, we moved to, to our little cabin across the lake. And our little cabin was, it's probably the size of a master bedroom these days. <laughs> but there was my mom and dad, my sister, and my brother and I. We lived in this cabin. And we really lived off the land. And, and most of my teachings, you know, were really formed and shaped who I was in those first five years of my life. And we were really lucky to have elders in our community, old elders who have long since passed, to embrace all of these, all of the children my age. And we were raised in this collective uh, family environment. And I have to say that that, that feeling of having, knowing that you are not alone really transforms and um, translates itself in every aspect of your life for the rest of your life. And I consider myself very, very lucky. I am very, very lucky. My family is extremely lucky because not all of us had this experience. So I was about six years old. We were in the cabin. It was winter and my dad is super handy guy and he uh well he's an architect but back then he was just a, he was a tinkerer and a builder and he had fashioned a windmill and we had this old transistor radio and you know with the am dials and everything and he fixed it all up and we used to listen to radio shows from all over the planet and it was incredible for me because um the music was something that always just it, i don't know what it was it was you know i guess it's like having any passion when you hear it for the first time you just want to hear more of it and you you want to know what it's about and you want to know how to dissect it and you want to know you know how you can do that too and i always just i just loved the music and I actually didn't even know at the time that my dad was a musician. <laughs> but that, that feeling of, of wanting to connect through music stuck with me. And I was a really shy child. And when I was about 10 years old, I was on the school bus. We're, we're, by this time, you know, we're in school. And I'm, you know, I'm riding the bus with my friends and we're laughing and we're joking and, and, uh, you know, they, they sort of teased me and called me into singing and I just started singing and this voice came out of me that was way bigger than anything that I'd ever heard before. And I didn't know where it came from and it kind of scared me, uh, but from that point on, I wanted to know what it was and I wanted to know how to use it. And it, and it sort of put me into a, on a path and a trajectory that I don't think I had really any control over. I just started going for things. And, and that's kind of how my, my parents were too. They just sort of raised me that way. Uh, if you have something in your mind that you, is your passion, you just go for it. So when I was 13, I moved to Vancouver with um, my brother and my dad and I studied music and I guess I've been studying music ever since and when I went away to university to study music and study voice um, you know I was in my early 20s and 
I wasn't quite sure that I had taken the right path. Because at that point in your life, you start to question, right? You start to want to form your own identity, I guess, away from your family or your parents. Um, and what happened was I discovered and I realized that the classical music was not my passion. I love to sing, um, but singing in that style wasn't what really fulfilled me. And that's when I discovered songwriting. And I spent many years songwriting and um, writing for other people. I didn't write one song that I would have considered singing for myself. It wasn't really an option. But I, I had a lot of years to sort of develop a craft, I guess, and, and learn the art of, of writing a song that I like. And one day, when I was living in Vancouver at the time, with my husband Robert, and you'll you'll meet him in a, in a couple minutes here. But one day when uh, we were sitting in our apartment in Vancouver, I said, um, "Let's can we go home? Can I can we go home?" And he said, uh, "What home?" Because his home is in the Netherlands. <laughs> and I said, uh, "My home." And he he kind of jokingly said, uh, "Like Burwash Landing." And I, I said, yeah, why not? Let's, let's do it. And, you know, right away, he immediately said, okay, let's do it. Let's try it. And this is coming from, you know, somebody who was born literally in the center of a city, of a large city in, the, in Europe, um, coming to, you know, sort of the city in Vancouver. And then I said, I will promise you we will live downtown in Burwash, <laughs> which we did. And... Um, <laughs> I thought that was, I thought that was really awesome because, uh, you know, he's just up for everything. Anyways, we moved home. And when I got home, I really realized what was missing in my life. And what was missing is, is that reconnection with this land, with the people. And, and the more I started to understand you know, the gaps, I guess, that I had in my life at that point, I really started to understand also that I was missing that connection to my language. And it took a long time for me to accept that to live a full life, a life that you feel is complete, um, has to be rooted in a sense of community and service and culture and language for me. And so since coming back to the Yukon, I guess almost 16 years now, I've spent that time trying to connect to that part of me where I feel that it's right and okay to share with the world the parts of my culture and, and life, I guess, that, um, that can make a person really vulnerable. But I've also know, and I've learned over the years, that a good story and a good song is one that shows that you're human and that you are vulnerable. We all are. And that's what people connect to, regardless of whether or not you understand what I'm singing, regardless of whether I'm singing in my language or if I'm singing um, in English. There's that, that moment of emotional connection happens at those vulnerable moments. Um, and that's, you know, that's something in itself that I have learned um, because I guess, you know, part of the re re um, residual effects of residential school in our communities is that people have learned to turn off 
that part of them which makes them vulnerable because it was dangerous. However, when I, you know, when the more that I talk with my mom and other, other family members and other community members and other friends and start to learn about that intergenerational uh, connection and the trauma that follows that connection, I really start to be, then discover how to, how to take those traumatic connections and, and sever them so that, so that what I am saying, what I'm singing, how I'm living is um, not tainted by that. And it's, it's a lifelong process. I absolutely am sure of that. So I would like to invite Robert to come and, and have a seat and we're just gonna, he's gonna put on the guitar. Hello. <laughs> so Robert's my husband and uh, he's also in the band where we play as a trio, Diet and the Love Soldiers. Um, I usually have another Robert on this side, which we call him Bob. Uh, and uh, unfortunately for Bob, I think he's in Mexico at the moment. <laughs> Poor guy, oh, eh? poor guy. But uh, we we do play as a trio, and um, we've been playing together really since the beginning of of me writing music for myself. And uh, I want to do a song. It's a relatively new song; it hasn't been recorded yet. Um, and it's called. I call it the old mother. When I wrote this, I was inspired to write this song um, on a last year, about this time of the year, end of January and February, early February. And I was driving uh, home in, in the dark. It was, it was like ink, the sky and, and was like ink. And it had been really overcast, so there was no light. Uh, and when I came, to the shores of Kalani Lake, you crest a summit. And as I was coming over the summit onto the shores, like a miracle, the cloud cover lifted and this incredible sky was revealed to me. And it was just lit from billions and billions of stars. And I got out of the car, I stopped the car and I, I got out and I just, watched and it and and felt what that felt like and it was so quiet i swear i could hear the mountains moving it was incredible and that moment stuck with me uh this song came out of that and the reason i want to share it with you is um is probably one of the uh times that i've been able to write a song that i felt captured an emotion and um, captured a moment in, in a very human, honest, and vulnerable way. There's a stillness and a calm Comfort me softly in the cold dark and Winter's long hold We're frozen where the slow ice fog drifts The past and the future stand still While the old mother sleeps Only brave crows stand guard throughout the night Here in the valley, the bitter winds rage till they die Afraid when the light would leave and the old mother sleep See with the grace to make. 
while the old mother sleeps. We'll take our time to make it last. The soul is deep and the sky is a vast. My days will change in thought. The time will pass Thank you, Shoni Thun. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking to you a little bit about how my language has informed my songwriting. So my language journey, I guess, began when I was born. I uh, was around elders. Uh, my grandmother is a is her, her first language is Southern Toshone. Um, and on all of the, the the grandparents, the grandmothers and grandfathers in the community. But I didn't learn the language from my mom because my mom actually had lost her ability to speak the language, not to hear it, but to speak it. And so growing up, um, the language was around and we heard it, we had it in school. Um, we had an incredible little school here and it was a, you know, the, the parents at the time, uh, felt that the, the government school wasn't, uh, enough for indigenous children. And this is in the early eighties. So, you know, it was a very different time. And so the community fundraised and we started our own school and we had, it was, it was a land-based language-based school. And it's very interesting because I, I would like to say that, you know, the experience of that experience of, of even just being able to go to the school for two years, which I was only allowed to do, um, set a foundation for for the rest of my life and and you know 
most of the children who went to that school went on to receive post educate post secondary education and are now leaders in not only our community but in in the territory and in really in the country so you know that experience really set me up for for a lifelong i guess desire to um, connect and language is a great way to do that but i had been disconnected from that my years away my years um, studying western music european music studying in other languages like french and italian and german um, and I also, at the, in the, those years, I learned to speak Dutch because my husband is Dutch. And I always thought about what was stopping me from learning my own language. Why could I not speak my own language in a way that I wanted to? So when we moved home, and I started to really question that and ask, ask myself those questions, I came to some harsh realizations. And one of the biggest realization that hit me like a slap in the face was that our elders, the people who never lost or gave up their language or had it taken away from them, were passing away. And you know, it, our language languages that we have eight languages in the Yukon indigenous languages they're all in critical condition um, and it, it's a really scary time to see that you know we are our elders are, are that speak these languages are passing my grandma is one of three living elders who speak our dialect of southern Shoshone it's a beautiful dialect because it's really rooted in these mountains. And she's 92. She's going to be 93 in a couple of months. And what hit me was that our language, especially our dialect, was really being lost because of this, um, of, of just the passing of years. And so I sort of did a deep dive, not just me, but many, many younger people, many young adults. And, and uh, we, we did this deep dive into our language. And I realized that I didn't know very much, that I had allowed, um, I guess, my the intoxication of, of living this, you know, living and traveling in, in a different uh in a different life and lifestyle, you know, lured me away from this desire or this, uh, this not the, not a desire, but this uh, connection to a language that is bone deep. So when I started this language journey in earnest and, and I, you know, realized also that there weren't any teachers in our local school that were t able to teach uh, our, our language and our dialect. Uh, so I decided, you know, amongst touring <laughs> and writing music, I decided to go back to school and, um, and become a, a native language teacher, instructor. And still, I didn't feel like I really knew much. And so one day I was sitting with my grandmother, I had a a commission, I guess, to explore writing a song in Southern Toshone that talked about the relationship of our people with our land, and as in particular, the Klawani National Park and Reserve, because that was not a positive relationship for about 60 years. Um, long story short, when the when the national the reserve and national park were established, um, they kicked all of the indigenous people whose home that had been for thousands of years out, and it became illegal for us to hunt, harvest, uh, live, and um, live our traditional way of life on that land. And so my grandmother had lived through this experience 
It happened when she was a young woman, the, the first um, displacement. And she never really thought that she would be able to uh, see the day where, where our people could go back into this land and, and use it, you know, the way that we had been using it for thousands of years. So I talked to her about this and I said, Grandma, you know, I, I have this commission. I feel really unsure of my language ability. Um, and I, I need your help because my experience with the land, our First Nation has signed our land claims agreement, which is like a modern day treaty. And in that modern day treaty, we took back control and we uh, co-managed this national park with the government of Canada. And in part of that deal is we use this, we, the land is returned to us in that way of, of harvest and cultural um, life. And so, you know, that's how I knew this land. And I had hiked those trails in the national park and I'd camped there and I'd enjoyed it like a national park, but I needed to understand what the land meant to my grandmother. And, uh, she started to talk to me and then she started to talk to me in Dunke, which is our language. And her relationship with that land was so vastly different from mine. And so what ended up happening is we, her and I wrote a song together and I call it Asi Kiyi. Asi is my grandfather, Kei is our country, this country. And that's actually what we call, the Kalani National Park and Reserve is actually called Asi Kei. Uh, that's its true name. Be and, and that relationship of the, of the people to the land is a familial one. We're family, we look after each other. And the land, these mountains are our grandfather. So I, I'm going to sing the song for you that her and I wrote together. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about what I am saying. And these became, this song actually became the story of my grandmother's story, not mine. It says, grandfather, you were taken from us for so long and it hurt us and we cried we cried for you and it was like longing for you and then when you were when you returned to us we cried tears of joy but now we're not going to cry anymore and just be thank and be thankful This song uh, goes kind of like this. Asia kei rishinka de kanu tadu heya heya de kanu tadu heya heya. Asia kei da cha na kwa ding ana uga yatsa sai na heya uga yatsa sai na heya heya Asia kei na kwa Hey ya, hey ya, ahutashan niti, ahutashan niti. Konishchij yedin ich, konishchij yedin ich. So Shoni Thun, thank you so much, everyone, for, for tuning in tonight and uh, listening. 
Um, I think that I have probably eaten up more of my time or more of your time than I should have. And uh, likely from here, I have to turn it over to Andrea to allow you guys to have an opportunity to say a few words. So thank you so much. Show Nathan. Uh, thank you so much, Diet, for, for sharing um, your music and your stories with us tonight. That was so incredibly moving. Um, so turning to our audience, um, please do uh, share your, your questions for Diet by using the Q&A function at the top or at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and I will be collecting those and I will pose them. Um, so yes, please do um, ask away. Uh, but I think maybe while we give our guests a chance to gather their thoughts and, and type in their questions, um, I thought I'd get us started with a little bit of conversation. Um, Diane, I found your, your whole talk so inspiring and fascinating. And one of the things that really, really struck me was this, the part of your story where you're, you're talking about your um, how you have this great passion for music. And of course, you were in Vancouver and this idea that like, you know, people think you have to be in this metropolitan city, but that you were equally sort of uh, motivated by by going back home. And I thought it was just such a nice message for our students about following your dreams and following following all of them all at the same time. <laughs> so I just I thought that was really, really beautiful. Um, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about that that transition when when you got home and what that was like being a musician in that space. I know that um, you have said that there were you know there were no venues to go to go sing and just kind of what that felt like and and the steps that you took when you got there. Um, yeah, it was a little scary at first. You know, you, you come, you're used to this life of busy um, and and opportunity. Uh, and then I came back to the village and um, it was really quiet. But what that quiet allowed me to do was actually to, to start to hone a craft, I think, um, and allowed me to put in the time to think and, and write and sort of find a voice in, in the way that I wanted to share my thoughts with the world really with you know with the public um so and it was you know it was it was great and and i have to say this community and and the territory in general was so supportive and and you know it was sort of like oh yay we have another musician like you know you want to play everywhere <laughs> so you know that, that's what i do find you know when when you come from a small town uh, and it feels like home but you feel scared to to make a career in that home, you don't have to be, you don't have to be. The world is so connected that uh, you can, you can, you might as well be happy and comfortable and, and you might as, might as well, you know, be surrounded by people that you love and that love you back. <laughs> that, that is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we have a few questions and comments coming in. Um, one, uh, Joanna um, is saying that she she doesn't have a question, but she just wanted to say that she so appreciates you sharing your story um, with us. Um, we have someone who would very much like to know if you have a Spotify account. Count. I do. Yes, I'm on sort of all the platforms, the streaming platforms. Um, so Spotify under Diet or Diet and the Love Soldiers. So there's uh, before there was Diet and the Love Soldiers, there was just Diet, even though it's the same three people. <laughs> Thanks. Um, my colleague uh, Greg King also had a question. He says um, that he's been very privileged to visit the lands of the Kluani First Nation in both summer and winter. Uh, and he says that the landscape is truly stunning. So can you speak about how your return to your home from Vancouver and the change in landscape in particular influenced the music that you wrote after the move? Good question. Um, all of the music that I've written <laughs> since I've come back, <laughs> I think is is rooted here. Um, I rarely write music anywhere else now. Um, it seems like they got a lot to say here. And a lot of the music that I do write is really um, sort of based and, and focused in, in environment, uh, whether that's physical or like this, you know, um, community, social environment 
in in the good the good and the harsh and the you know cold um and just the, the the incredible beauty i find that the the landscape here is absolutely it's magnetic i can't describe it it's something that it like greg you have to see and feel uh the air feels differently sometimes to me um and it and the 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 all this rock that we sort of sit on is is so magnetic and it really does pull you in in a in a different way Oh, I did that that thing <laughs> where I wasn't unmuted. Um, we're coming to the top of the hour, but I think we have time for one more um, really lovely questions from Willow White. Um, and this, um, she is thanking you and uh, also saying that she loves how you write music in many different languages, sorry, languages. And um, do those different languages offer different things to you artistically? Certainly for me, it, there's an ease in writing in English. There is uh, just the way that my, my brain was wired, I guess, um, for the written word. And I'm learning how to, to write music in my own language because it's not written and it, it was never based in, in that sort of scribing way. So I have to turn my brain around or turn it off so that I'm able to find the right words that express in the right way uh, what it is I want to say. Uh, and, and most of the time I need, you know, I need to have um, support from my mentors and my teachers. But one thing what, I should what? say, oh, sorry. One thing I should say is I'm starting something new and I, I'm learning, um, I want to learn to write new traditional music <laughs> in a way that's not influenced by the Western, like, you know, pentatonic kind of scales and things like that. So it's just, uh, it's really um, rooted in, in the traditional oral history or in custom, I guess. Um, we did have one more question come in and it's from, um, one of my colleagues in music here, so I thought we should give voice to the music question. So if you don't mind, I'll squeeze one more in. Um, Ardell Reese is saying, um, thank you for many thanks for a truly beautiful presentation. How do your children experience uh, music and what do you hope for them and their future as connected to the land and connected to music? Well, our, we have two children. Um, one's a young adult now, he just graduated last year, and the other is uh, just starting her teen years. So this is, it's a lot of fun, <laughs> but um, we, we have our children toured with us when they were small. Um, they always listening to music, and it was very interesting, it's been interesting. We kind of assumed that they would want to be in our band or they would want to start their own band. But both of them, um, like our son, for example, is in a, his connection to this land is, is so deep that he, to watch him walk through snow in winter through trees is music in itself. It's really beautiful. He's so connected. And our daughter uses that creativity, I think, you know, she's always humming and singing. They don't want to play music, like play an instrument or anything like that. Um, but she uses that, the, the, I guess, just from what she knows and how to access a creative part of her brain. And she is very creative with her hands. So, you know, in their, in their own ways, you can see how music influences children. And I would say definitely that um, regardless of whether our children take formal lessons or they, you know, are musicians themselves, if you have music and especially, you know, um, like that heart music, that, you know, music of your culture um, around them, it informs everything that, you know, they do and, and without them even knowing it. So they think they're they are 
um, resisting you, but really we know better. Uh, that is a perfect <laughs> note on which to end, I think. Thank you so much for really a beautiful evening and very, very inspiring. Um, and I have heard that uh, you that you were scheduled to uh, possibly be in Camrose Live in April. And so I very much look forward to um, seeing you and meeting you in person. And, and hopefully um, our audience members will be able to do that too. Um, so I will now pass us back to Victoria, uh, who's going to bring this session to a close with some information about upcoming events. And thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for joining us at home as well.